EV Revolution show is supported in part by Budget Safe Solar. If you are considering solar in most any part of North America, give my friends a call. They will take the time to listen to your specific situation and help you reach a decision about what's available to you and what makes the most sense. If you would like to join the growing solar industry, they'd like to speak with you. Go to www.budgetsafesolar.com to contact them. All right, and welcome everybody to this special edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bokor, your host, and for those listening on the audio podcast, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a very special show, something that's near and dear to me. I've been a big fan of this guest for decades as he's been doing uh, his car work uh, for many, many, many years. I've been following him since pretty well day one. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce my guest today, Mr. John H. Davis. He's the creator, host, and managing director of Motor Week. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Ken, how are you? It's great to be with you. I'm excellent. You know, as we said before, I press the record button. I am a little starstruck. I don't get starstruck too often. I've worked with a lot of oh, people, on, but uh, I've followed your show. And man, I, you know, I'm a car, old car guy, probably own personally 30 different vehicles in my life so far. So mo- getting a lot of inspiration and knowledge from Motor Week has been a mainstay for me. Thank you very much. And you guys do a great job. Now, for those who don't know what Motor Week is, and you must be living under a rock if you don't, but... Um, Shame you know, on you. I exactly. Mean, there's, there's no excuse. <laughs> exactly. Motor Week is television's longest running and most wow. respective automotive series. Um, you guys debuted in 1981 under uh, uh, a new television genre at the time, basically, by becoming the first weekly series to offer consumer-oriented car and truck reviews do-it-yourself care tips for cars and the latest industry auto news. And, you know, uh, John, I parallel what I do in your, in that style. I mean, that's kind of what I do on my channel is, you know, very consumer focused and the average person kind of, you know, Joe focused uh, element to talking about the automobile market. And you guys have been on Maryland public television for uh, the 41 years now, and um, you're on 92% of all PBS stations, uh, correct? MPT is... Uh-huh. Yeah, MPT is, uh, you know, our, our, they are our producing uh, company, mm-hmm. not my company. Mm-hmm. I work for them. Yep. And yes, we've been on, uh, currently we're on about 90 plus percent of the PBS stations around the country. Uh, we're seen over the border in uh, Canada in quite a few spots, but usually off of the U.S. stations. Yep. Uh, we're also on the uh, MAV TV uh, cable network, which is a motorsports network. We've mm-hmm. been on various commercial cable systems over the years. Of course, the younger audience, uh, really, when you say television, they don't really relate to that. So video, (laughs) any video screen you've got, we're there either streaming through, oh, pbs.org slash Motor Week. You go to our YouTube uh, channel, youtube.com slash Motor Week, where we're about 3 million folks mm-hmm. are able to tune into everything we've done for like the last two decades mm-hmm. uh, there. Uh, if you've got a screen, you can watch Motor Week. As, as, uh, I picked up a phrase from a, a friend of mine. Um, we're on every screen available everywhere. You just got to find us. And of course, that's what we hope you'll do. Absolutely. Right, so I'm done. I'm done with the advertising. So no, I, I definitely wanted that advertising, and I do. I am a YouTube subscriber as well, and watch all the episodes, and I get a kick out of the, some of the retro stuff as well because I remember um, looking at that. Retros. Yeah, yeah, those are a lot of fun. Ben Davis, uh, no relation to me, uh, 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 one of our producers, he puts the retro road test and the holiday U.S. holiday marathons where they go twenty four seven over a weekend. He puts those out all together and, you know, he goes back 41 years, you know, mm-hmm. and we've got virtually everything digitized. Uh, so um, it's one of those things where we have a, a big following for our retro road tests, but it's mostly thanks to Ben. And you deserve the big following because they're just great. Like I said, I, I virtually grew up, you know, when I was a teenager, watched, started watching you guys. 
and have been for those decades. Now, for folks wondering about yourself, not only being the host for the show, but, you know, and, and since day one, um, but, you know, certainly you have a, a background in aerospace engineering as a graduate and mechanical as well as a graduate of North Carolina State, if I've got your bio correctly. Uh, you hold a Master of Business admin as well from the University of North Carolina, and you're involved in all kinds of other things, including you know, different uh, committees, uh, your founders of the North American uh, Car and Truck of the Year Awards. There's lots of stuff that you are involved with in the automotive landscape, correct? When, you, when you're old, you get, you have a lot of stuff after your name, you know, it's like. Nobody's <laughs> saying that. It's not, oh, come on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I, I um, actually, one of my, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, being one of the founders of the North American Car and Truck and now SUV of the Year Award. Mm -hmm. However, I have to point out, we modeled it after both the European Car of the Year and mm -hmm. the and what uh, some of the efforts that were going on in Canada at the time. So. Oh, great, excellent. Well, great to hear. So, you know, who better than to have yourself on my show to talk about electric vehicles and the impact that they've made over these uh, only small amount of time years uh, in the automotive market. I mean, one of the things I also do, John, is I do a lot of volunteer public outreach and promoting mm -hmm. electric vehicles and basically bringing education and awareness to them. And I talk about some of the history, you know, they were around before internal combustion vehicles were back in the 18th century. So, you know, it's just that that Ford guy, you know, was able to develop a, a fast way to build ice vehicles. And that's kind of what, you know, how the industry started. And uh, we went from horse and wagon to that. But, you know, if we, we talk a little about a bit about EV history, I mean, you remember the EV one, you, you remember some of the early stuff. What's your thoughts back then of when all that started? What were you thinking? Well, you know, everybody thinks that the modern EV, first of all, EVs have been around since I believe the 20s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you go to downtown Detroit, Motor City, about uh, two blocks north of, of the main core of downtown on a side street is an old derelict uh, brick building. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's got the name of the uh, power company on the side. I think it was Detroit Edison, I know it was. Yeah. And that actually was the charging station for the original electric cars that were running around, I guess in the 20s, maybe early 30s, mm -hmm. but certainly in the 20s. And the idea is people would drive them into town, they'd plug them in there and they'd go to work. So they've been around for a long time. You mentioned the EV1, which everybody pretty much agrees was uh, a pioneer that GM dropped the ball on. But even before the EV1, we've got archival footage going back to when we started in, in 81 of various attempts to electrify vehicles, either as an aftermarket or someone doing something unusual. I remember the, uh, the, uh, the Dodge Caravan that had the electric powertrain that was basically uh, an early uh, hydrogen fuel cell. I'm not sure mm -hmm. it really ran, but they showed mm -hmm. it. So it really took a couple of things. Uh, it took, I think, Toyota with, and, and Honda making the basic hybrid practical to get people started in that area. Because most people really, when you talk electric cars, they include hybrids. They're not, they don't really know what a plug-in hybrid is, and then they right. think all electric. That started it, but I think you have to give a lot of credit to uh, Elon Musk because mm -hmm. he, instead of, while well, everybody else, and we we're talking now in, in the early 2000s, while well, everybody else looked at an electric car as maybe a cheap commuter mm -hmm. that you could use instead of producing a lot of fumes and everything while you sit in traffic, he recognized its potential as a premium luxury vehicle. And I remember the original um, uh, Tesla Roadster. Uh, we've, mm -hmm. we've tested to them twice before the sedan, uh, the S sedan ever came along. Mm -hmm. But he made something you wanted to aspire to. And that has spawned everything else you see now. So whether you like him or not, and I don't think liking him has anything to do with it, whether you, you have to admire his business savvy, the fact he's done something that nobody thought he could, including me, mm -hmm. and he's made the electric car desirable and something you can charge 60, 70, 80, $100,000 for. Now, of course, to become ubiquitous, you've got to do a lot better than that. 
And actually, that's one of the areas where I think companies like Volkswagen, specifically uh, the Hyundai Kia Group and General Motors and Ford are picking up on and probably price and get it down. You know, they, we say, oh, well, if you can get it into the 30s without any kind of tax incentives, you're there. Uh, we're, we're, we're pretty close to that. I think the Nissan Leaf certainly showed that you could do it. Uh, but now we've got to get cars that are more sophisticated, bring the price down even further to get them. But of course, we all know that's just part of the equation. Uh, the other uh, two parts of the equation are one, enough chargers, fast chargers uh, nationwide so that there is uh, common as gas stations. And also getting people, um, unfortunately, used to the fact that even given the best technology right now, you're not going to be able to gas and go for as long a distance as you can with a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're on our way. I do think it's the future. It's not going to come as fast as the politicians think. <laughs> I think uh, electric sales right now are badly skewed because of the pandemic. I don't think they're reality. But by the time things turn to return to normal, maybe they will be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the late the first six months of the year in the US, auto sales were down 18% from last year, which was dismal. Mm -hmm. So you're probably only going to do 12 and a half, 13 million vehicles this year, and electric vehicles may actually get darn close to that 10%. I'm talking fully yep. electric vehicles. Yep. Uh, and that's great. But I think if this was a normal market, that wouldn't be true. So with all these folks that are so excited about that, just temper your enthusiasm because at some point, a lot of people that are just buying electric cars now because they want to buy something, they may not come back. And there's early evidence that a lot of early adopter uh, EV buyers are not buying a second one. Hmm. I think we'll know, give it a couple more years. It's going to take that long because people have a lot of these vehicles out on lease. And we'll, but having said that, it's clear how government's pollution, what they consider pollution free vehicles, and we could argue that all day. Uh, the American market is being pulled along. I don't think we're going to adopt uh, electric vehicles, say, at the speed they are in Europe. Mm -hmm. We don't have the financial incentives, and it doesn't look like with our current government we're going to get that. And I think that's pretty critical. Uh, the uh, tax incentives that are out there now uh, have helped, and but they're running out. Right. So I would say if you're an EV advocate, great, enjoy it. I think EVs as a whole, and stop me if I'm going too long, we have reached the threshold where they make sense with a 250 to 300 mile range common. They make sense as a vehicle, something you can drive around town, commute in, they make perfect sense. There's enough chargers. You put a charger in your house, and that's really the, the premise of, of what's going to make it work anyway, is mm -hmm. having a, a level two charger on two, you know, 220, 240 volts. You're to the point where they make sense, and you can charge them up overnight at home and go about your merry way. I still don't think they are practical for Americans, and I'm speaking for uh, <laughs> when I mean the United States, not necessarily all of North America. Yeah. I don't think they're practical for long distances. I don't think uh, the American public uh, is going to routinely be willing to stop for 20, 30, 40 minutes uh, at a gas station for a charge, uh, you know, so they can go the next 200 miles before they've got to do it again. And I think they've got to overcome that. And I don't know what the magic number is. Maybe it's a, a 600 mile range like we hear is coming uh, in a, a couple of vehicles. I mean, mm -hmm. besides uh, uh, the Lucid, of course, uh, five, 600 miles, uh, I think is what you're going to have to have before people embrace them as a long distance vehicle. Yeah. And I think now, you, well, that I was, mean, a, that was a long answer to a, a, a oh, short that's, question. That's so great. Cause we, we covered a lot of stuff that uh, I, you know, I did want to mention. So, and you're absolutely correct on, on, on everything. Um, Certainly, the transition to electric vehicles is a long transition. Uh, I think there may be targets set by governments around yes. the world. And, you know, you mentioned the politicians. They tend to work within four-year timeframes anyway. 
<laughs> that's that's their style. Once they're elected, they're working to get reelected again. But um, so policy aside, there are targets. But you know, it's good to set goals. Will we achieve all these goals? Maybe not. But at least we can take some steps there. But this transition to electric vehicles, especially all electric, and I'm the same. I I typically try to talk more about BEVs versus you know uh, uh, plug-in hybrids. There's still some good choices there. But the hybrid vehicle itself that, that we know of, the, the traditional hybrid, I don't see as really, you know, I think we're almost past that technology point, but, you know, people still need that. Yeah, I disagree. That. Yeah, you disagree with that. Okay, that's good. We have a little disagreement. I disagree with that. Absolutely. Okay. If you yeah. want to get people mm -hmm. into plug-in hybrids or fully mm -hmm. electric, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. I don't personally, I think the only automaker that's smart right now is Toyota because most of their new vehicles are coming out either with a standard hybrid, traditional yeah. hybrid powertrain, mm -hmm. or, or it's an inexpensive option. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single new internal combustion engine vehicle that should be brought to market right now without a, a traditional hybrid system, mm. because that will get the people that are absolutely, I don't want any part of this, mm -hmm. into these vehicles, they will understand the extra power they get, mm -hmm. and they of course don't have to plug in for it. It's not taking it's it's extending your your fuel economy from sure. you know let's say thirty to fifty. Um, so I I actually think we are not at all beyond that, and I That's also believe, mm -hmm. I think that General Motors had the Volt as much as they messed up with the EV one, the Volt was the real pioneer. Mm -hmm. because it took a um, internal combustion engine as a generator married it with a decent sized battery and gave you a vehicle that had uh, you know at the end there was about almost 60 miles worth of EV yes. driving a lot of the plug-in hybrids now have been edging back towards that but they're mm -hmm. not there yet so they may right. suit someone in Europe that commutes five miles to work and back but they haven't been suiting Americans Correct. but if you have a plug-in hybrid that's got 50 60 miles, and or even a hundred, so somebody could plug it in once a week, mm -hmm. take it, uh, drive it to work five days a week or whatever, and then plug it in again on the weekends. They would get so used to that, mm -hmm. that then making that next step would be easier. So I think there's no one size fits all. I think that the market deserves to have all three of these: a regular hybrid, plug-in hybrids with decent range. Yep. and affordable battery electrics to make this really a transition. If you can, if governments continue down this road of trying to jam everybody into BEVs, mm -hmm. they're not only going to fail, the, the population in this country, in the U.S., is going to reject it, mm -hmm. and you're going to end up with a lot of vehicles that can't be sold. And I am very worried about that because if they BEVs get a bad name for Either rely not to so much reliability, but you know it's just too much, too much Us of a usability pain to, to sure. charge them up, mm -hmm. uh, and and expense. You know, starting many of them still start fifty, sixty thousand, and mm -hmm. yeah, that's it's a mindset. People think that's a lot of money, even though the the transaction price of an average vehicle in the U.S. is now I think about forty, uh, so it's not much of a stretch. But my point is, every time in this country. And I'm not talking about any other country in the United States. And you've got to make it work here or it's going to flop. Mm -hmm. Every time the government has tried to force consumers into something, the consumers have rejected it and voted those people out. And if that happens here, it could cost the auto industry just billions and billions and billions of dollars and do and and potentially kill the appetite for BEVs except for 10 15 20 percent of the market and that's not right. the goal yeah, so that's, i that's i know point. regular hybrids or plug-in hybrids have run their course and you know automakers are hedging their bets even the gm and you know and I have a, and sort of Volkswagen too, because they have various divisions. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to be all BEV. Well, we're, that's all right, you know, uh, because we're not going to leave the internal combustion engine buyer out there. As a matter of fact, just recently, after all this fanfare of Volkswagen saying we're going to be 100% electric, 
Well, the guys over at Audi are saying, now, nah, well, we're going to keep making ICE engines for, you know, quite a while. Mm -hmm. So just don't get caught up in all the headlines and all the press releases, because by the time these vehicles come to market, somebody else is going to be running the company probably with a different mindset. So anyway. No, great points. And, and I, I, I uh, like your enlightening about the hybrids because uh, you do make a valid point. Um, you know, there definitely can be, uh, definitely is still choice that's needed for consumers. And you're absolutely right. You can't force consumers into some of these things. They have to have that initial desire, at least to, to want to, to stretch into something else. Um, I think EVs today, at least give them much more choice than they did, you know, a short five or oh, yeah. more years ago. So you said those comfort levels. Um, I think home charging is, is probably underrated that uh, at least, you know, in Canada, we have the last numbers I saw at the end of 2021, we had about 280,000 plugins on the road and we have 8 million homes and homes being, you know, a, a townhouse, a detached or a semi, something that you could, in theory, you know, spend, you might have to spend a few bucks, but put a level two in. And so right away, there's kind of like almost low hanging fruit for a consumer market to go after. It doesn't take away from condos and others, but they're that cap uh, and also adding in the fact yeah. that most dwellings here are at least two vehicles in the driveway, if not even more. Um, so even looking at a sure. secondary non-primary vehicle and fully electrifying it to again, get that experience, get your feet wet, could be a good viable option for many as well. Oh yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've twice gotten almost to signing and buying uh, a modern EV. <laughs> And twice. Right. in both cases, uh, twice, I backed out because of range issues. Mm -hmm. I've been, my house has been wired with a, a level two charger for seven, eight years, mm. something like that. Uh, and we've been testing them, of course, for uh, longer than that. But anyway, uh, the premise in this, if you talk to EV advocates in this country, if you talk to them five, six, seven years ago, their whole plan for this to work was that people would charge at home and not have to go to a gas station, not have to seek any other thing out, you know, outside of their house. Um, of course, the problem is that now that we're talking 300 mile plus mile range, but you know, if you drive it back and forth to work a few days a week and then plug it in for eight hours, you'll get back what you just, yep. you know, what yeah. you uh, put your stuff. So it, it's a very, uh, anyway. Yeah, it's a very viable option um, for sure. The technology is, as you said earlier, um, it's it's much better. I would think uh, I would say like one of the one of my approaches, John, as well, since you know it's the first time that you're you're understanding what I do, is I am very much a consumer base. So uh, I'd I'd like to see the adoption, but I also ask people what their use cases is, what are their needs, you know, what's their lifestyle and so forth to understand, because I agree, an EV doesn't work for everybody today. Um, you know, it's got to look at the use case and what's good for them. And as I said earlier, this transition is a decades long transition, you know, oh, internal absolutely. combustion isn't going away anytime soon, it's, no matter what you read. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen by 2030, 2035. 2040, I don't think 2050. Be to see it. I yeah. would say, yeah. I would say 2050. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking 2050 will probably be selling, you know, 60% EVs. Yeah. But right now, to give you an answer, you know, you didn't ask me, but I'll tell you anyway. The first sure. EV I looked at was was the um, the Mini SE. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I really want. I have an old, I have a 2002 Mini, mm. and I wanted to replace it. I like the way Minis drive. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love this car. Yeah. But I wanted to have something like it that, I mean, the SE was perfect, mm -hmm. but I couldn't get past, you know, that 100 plus mile range. Right. So then I looked at, um, I fell in love with the Mustang Mach-E. I mm -hmm. thought I was going to hate it, but I loved driving it. I liked <laughs> just about everything about it. And, you know, the 300 mile range on paper, yep. but my wife and I, one weekend to try it out, we did about a. 200 mile, under 200 mile round trip uh, out towards the eastern shore of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we topped it off at one point, but it was a cold day running mm -hmm. the heater, uh, running the stereo, you know, basically being comfortable because this is how we test vehicles as you mm -hmm. in a real world. Long story short is by the time we got home, um, 
it was not even registering that we had any charge left. Mm. So to go visit, say, my sister who lives uh, about 350 miles away, I would have easily had to stop twice because after all, when you recharge at a fast charger, you're only getting 80%. Mm -hmm. And there was yeah. no fast yeah. charger. She lives in, a, in a, a, a very progressive college town. There was no fast charger in that town. And oh, I'm not sure that it still is today. Mm -hmm. So I would have had to go 10 or 15 miles mm -hmm. from her house to use a fast charger. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't take delivery. I had one ordered and I said, yeah. be my guest, sell it to someone else. And I'm sure it was gone in about 60 seconds. <laughs> so they've got yeah. that mindset is my mindset of practicality. Even it's going to be pervasive because even though people know today, anyone that does any research, that these are very viable as second automobile. Mm -hmm. People don't think that way. They think right. in an emergency, right. I want to be able to get in it and go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, going to be a problem for a while longer. Also, there's another problem. And I don't know about you, but, you know, obviously 70% of all the sales of electric vehicles in this country are still Teslas. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of them on the interstate. And because those buyers are trying to maximize their range, they're going quite slow. I mean, for the most part, you know, if traffic on a major U.S. interstate is 70, most everybody, unfortunately, is going 80. Mm -hmm. They're going 70, maybe a little, maybe 65. Mm -hmm. And that's another mindset that is going to have to change because I, you can drive any of these modern EVs on secondary roads with speeds 50, 55 miles an hour. And you could easily see the stated range mm -hmm. by 10, 15, 20%. On the interstates, nope, not so much. Higher the speed, right. just like gasoline. The faster yeah. you go, the more you use. Mm -hmm. And I think that psyche is going to be very, very tough. And I've spent enough time in Canada to know you have, you have even more wide open country you know, heading yeah. west than we do. And even though I think your law enforcement there is very strict, uh, there are places where you can open it up. And I think that's going to deter. Uh, it's going to give Canadians a problem with accepting these two. So, you know, again, I make it sound like I'm not an advocate. I am an advocate. I'm just a realist. And uh, I like so, to temper people's enthusiasm. No, I totally understand. And I think that approach as well. And, you know, I will counter a little bit on the long distance charging because you're absolutely right. It's very much a specific uh, uh, experience or area that people live in that it's going to be an extremely positive element to something they can capitalize on or it's going to be a not so positive as you mentioned in your story there. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it, it's you we're on, still- You live in the US. <laughs> yeah. You live on a coast. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. You know, like in our, in our, I live outside of Baltimore, Washington. I mean, uh -huh. it's terrific. We've got chargers virtually everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other, other hand, you head south towards the uh, deeper south in this country and mm -hmm. head to the Midwest, not so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's similar to Canada. You know, 80% yeah. of our population is southern uh, along the, along the border, uh, southern base. So you, you kind of go beyond those areas and it's going to be a wasteland, you know, of uh, trying to find something. Um, so again, the importance of, you know, individuals trying to understand what their needs are, map it into that, you know, there, the good news is that there continues to be a charging infrastructure, um, funding allocated on various levels at, at various elements, and they continue to roll out over time. Um, so it really is, you know, because I talked to a lot of EV owners that have, wouldn't hesitate to take a road trip tomorrow, but obviously it depends where. Uh, my first vehicle was a, was a 2018 40 kilowatt leaf. And so I had to plan a lot more you know i loved i love the vehicle great vehicle i'm in sales so i my geography is southern ontario and in the winter time it would be tough to get around on that 40 kilowatt i totally agree with you and i went through that for two winters i had to plan and think and stop longer than i normally would have um i can tell you i do have a model three long range and i wouldn't hesitate to get in that vehicle and go to drive to los angeles tomorrow if i had to um, because i know that there's a, an infrastructure along the whole way 
uh, because it's following major routes and major highway patterns. Uh, if I wanted to go to Northern Ontario, I'd have to really think that over because that would be the total opposite <laughs> experience, right? As an example. So uh, you're absolutely right. It's not fair for everybody. So it really does depend on those case circumstances. But you hit, your, you hit on a, a key thing that some manufacturers have not woken up to yet. Mm. It, that it's one, one of the things I loved about the Mach-E and, and I know uh, Tesla has a similar uh, programming. Uh, they'll tell you where the chargers are. Mm -hmm. They'll plot the course for you. They'll tell you if they're available. I mean, yes, you can have apps on your phone, but it's a whole lot easier if the car basically is doing that kind of thinking for you in advance, mm -hmm. where some of the, the newest vehicles we've had in, and specifically uh, the Ionic 5 and the EV6 didn't mm -hmm. have that feature. And it, even mm -hmm. though I think those are wonderful vehicles, uh, I'd rather have that kind of information integral with the car's infotainment system than rely on uh, cell phone service, which, again, can be kind of spotty. So Absolutely that mm -hmm. help, the car needs to help you dispense with your range anxiety in an mm -hmm. active fashion. And I would encourage anybody that goes in to look at an electric car, if they're going to use it for uh long distance travel, I mean, to, over the outside the metro area they live mm -hmm. in, uh, they need to be asking about what the car can do to help you plot the course and find an available charger. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the other thing is the charging companies have to do a better job on these uh, machines. I mean, they're yes. not plug and play. I don't care yeah. what <laughs> they all say. Yeah. And recent surveys here have shown up to a third of them uh, inoperative at any mm -hmm. one time. That's got to change. That's, totally. that's, that's a very frustrating thing. Totally agree with you. I mean, you, we go to a gas station and maybe at one of the pumps are out or one of the, you know, one of the terminals or whatever you want to call it are out. Okay. That doesn't happen very often, but it, it can on some of the fast charging uh, situations. So the reliability is still, you know, a concern that has to be dealt with. And that ease of use, as you mentioned, John, you know, Tesla does it with their, because everything's app based. They, because they own their network, they, as you talked about Elon before, he thought ahead, I'm going to have to build something to support what I'm going to sell. And that's that really makes a very strong competitive differentiator between Tesla and some of the other models because they own that network. All the telemetry is real time in the cloud and everybody talks at the same time. So I could, we went to, to New Brunswick last year and I just went take me from Toronto to Fredericton and the car will plan how many stops, where to stop and how long I have to stop. And if I'm driving and something happens, you know, maybe I'm going too fast and the range is going to be a little less than the car I thought it was, it's going to reroute me and tell me, I think I need to go here now for 25 sure. minutes instead of over there for 10. So that, that experience, you're right, needs to be ambiguous throughout all the OEMs that you just, you let the car deal with all that to give you that peace of mind. And that's still a challenge, uh, you know, with most of the OEMs today, because they're, they're, they're relying on private public networks that aren't part of their ecosystem, correct? Yeah, now I don't know, I can't speak for Canada. I don't know, mm -hmm. are your utility systems, national utility systems is your power system? No, national? they're they're regional, they're all regional based, provincial in most parts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's at least an improvement. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. ours are basically, you know, individual, city mm -hmm. and, and you know, like our state of maryland i think we have uh three or four different power companies within just a, right. a small state and that makes it difficult because some are more aggressive at putting in the power needed for the mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. than others there's also false advertising by a lot of the car companies they bring out something and say wait we've got an 800 volt architecture and we can take all this power and then you get to the fast char fast charger and it's 50 kilowatts or whatever. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a slow, fast charger. Right. Uh, right. We've done various uh, trips uh, uh, measuring the usability from uh, our, across the state and across mm -hmm. our region. And, you know, we're still basically sometimes having to stay up all night in an RV camp to charge up enough right. to get to go to the next fast charger. So yeah. they're, they're, it's so hodgepodge right now. And that brings me back to my point before. I'm afraid of all of this because we didn't put the, you know, you're right. Tesla built the system, built up his charging system, then made basically cars. He's still building up his charging system, mm -hmm. where for everybody else, it's coming behind the vehicles. Although I am, uh, I, I was actually encouraged when they, when uh, Elon Musk talked about last year about 
opening up his charging system to everyone, but I have a feeling that Tesla owners would not like that very much. It will happen, but it'll happen in a small, limited fashion because you're absolutely right. You don't want to burn your base of clients and prospects that you have because if that is a competitive advantage and why give it away? He needs the money. He needs and he needs the income stream for sure. Right. Um, I, you're absolutely right. We are in that transition phase from a charging infrastructure as well as you know that that plethora initial wave of EVs come through. We need something to back that up, and the change needs to happen. It's not happening fast enough, but. Again, I would go back to that individual perspective of, you know, of consumers that may be watching and listening to this that are thinking, you know, look in your area, look at what your your patterns are, look at what your needs are and see what can mm -hmm. fit. Because, again, for my long distance experience, I don't have a problem, at least in the Tesla, even in the Nissan, I put uh, over 45,000 kilometers on it in two years. So I drove it. Um, yeah. 90, you know, 90 percent of that was home charging. When I did need to fast charge, I didn't really have a problem in finding spots for the most part. It was just some of the technology even four years ago was still a little on and off, on and off. But um, so, you know, it's a hit and miss depending on where you are, as you said, what region, what county, what city, what state uh, and all that I mean, stuff. So I'm right now there. You would think even even though it's on the coast that uh, all of the East Coast of the U.S. and all of uh, mm -hmm. the West Coast of the U.S. would be saturated with chargers, and actually, when you get south of Washington D.C., so you're not very far south, right, right. Uh, they become harder to find. Mm. Fortunately, the, uh, the electrify America, Walmart, okay. and, yeah. and, and Sam's Club, and stuff like that, they've gone in with Electrify America, and they tend to put those chargers near the interstates. So they can be used, but right. <laughs> again, reliability is not always there. I True. guess in Europe they're doing much more government uh, uh, sponsored, but then their distances in between cities are less too. So you you talked about some of the OEMs, and and that's one of the things I talk about as well. Is I try to represent what's going on with all the major OEMs. Tesla certainly is the catalyst; it continues to drive the market forward. But Absolutely. to really make that significant change in the global. Uh, light duty vehicle sales. We need all the OEMs to, to get involved as much as they can to make that transition. If you were to summarize, you know, in your opinion, who's kind of taking those those steps to get where they are today and where, where you think are going to be kind of leaders in the EV market for, let's say, by the end of this decade, if you were to pick two or three or four, any anything stand out for you there, John? Yeah, I think uh, I think Volkswagen, the, the Volkswagen brand, and mm -hmm. that's largely, let's face it, because of Dieselgate, they probably yeah. wouldn't be doing this otherwise. Mm -hmm. Volkswagen certainly is uh, is going to be a, a big player and a big catalyst. Uh, I think Ford Motor Company uh, deserves a lot of credit for going all in. GM wants to wants to do it and is finally starting to roll out the vehicles, but it's like virtually everything they ever do, they talk about it for a lot longer <laughs> than until it finally I happens. Know. I do think they're going to be a huge catalyst, mainly, I think, because the F-150 and the Chevrolet Silverado, you know, two of the uh, most popular vehicles on the in this continent and in North and America, yeah. worldwide, mm -hmm. you know, those vehicles are going to get a lot of EVs out there and a lot of hands very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think coming up from the rear uh, as far as volume, uh, but who's going to be a big player globally and in the U.S., is the Hyundai Kia group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got other got people like Volvo and all, but you know, there's they're small players. The big players, yep. Volkswagen, Ford, GM, uh, Hyundai, Kia. And I'm not sure if I forgot anybody. I think those are the ones that certainly can do the vehicles at a reasonable price to broaden out the market. Mm -hmm. And from all intents of term, and from what we've seen, that's exactly what they're doing. I mean, I I think uh, uh, the efforts we've seen from all of them right now are, are pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, they certainly have the scale. They have the the ability right. to do those economies of scale. You know, Volkswagen with a 600,000 plus workforce, 130 plants of various sizes globally in that in that group, including commercial. They, you know, there's a lot of elements there that can certainly scale. Uh, Stellantis is a little bit slower as well in getting off the gate, but you know they've got these plans as well to slowly electrify some of their different models. You know we got good news that some some stuff's going to happen here in Windsor and in Ontario, some battery manufacturing as well. So you know some people are concerned about jobs and some of those those workforce transitions. 
Uh, and that's a question I'd like to ask you. How do you see, do you see, do you think people sh- that are in the automotive sector in that marketplace should be concerned about, about their future livelihood or would the, will there be a, a good transition plan for most of the OEMs for them? Well, clearly because uh, EVs require less components uh, mm-hmm. than you know a traditional uh, internal combustion engine, that makes sense that would, there would be less people needed on the assembly lines. I mean, we've already gone through an enormous shaving down of uh, manufacturing employment through right. automation, robots mm-hmm. and all that. We did that during you know, the last uh, generation. Mm-hmm. So now there's gonna be further. However, the OEMs are starting to take a huge interest in being their own battery suppliers and or at least being having facilities to put together the battery packs. Well, guess what? They're going to need people to do that. You can't do that all by robot. So I right. certainly think if I was young and I was working on an assembly line and didn't think I was going to retire anytime soon and didn't have the seniority, if I had a chance to jump over there and do some kind of assembly work in the new battery plant, which is probably going to be cleaner, uh, have a better environment, you know, great air conditioning, because you've got to keep all that, that stuff at, at, at good temperatures during mm-hmm. manufacturing. I jump because I think that's where the future is. So I don't see the number of people working in automotive assembly going up, but I actually think that it's probably going to be relatively stable, but you'll have to be able to learn some new skills mm-hmm. in the process. Uh, because everywhere you turn, somebody's uh, trying to do either a new manufacturing plant for batteries or, of course, chips. Right. You know, almost every brand is trying to build their own chip factory. In source. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because of what we're going through. And I'm thinking that as long as it's connected to the major automakers, it's still going to be represented by the same unions and so forth. Uh, not like many of the component suppliers right. these days that use non-union labor. And I know that's important in both our countries so absolutely is and you know certainly a valid point and i i agree with you i think that there are openings and and transitional uh movement for that workforce and to get to these areas uh all the major oems are inking not only either partnership agreements and whether jointly in sourcing or completely just bringing it all in building other plants you know you talked about hmc hyundai motor corp which is the kia genesis and hyundai brands uh, you know a building another plant in the U.S. now because uh, it, South Korea is becoming a constraint for, for availability and, and to get EVs out the door. So there are, uh, you know, VW spinning up Chattanooga faster than, than they thought they would to get EVs going for North America because the demand's there. Uh, w- one question I want to ask is get your opinion. Now, I did just some slight analysis myself a couple of months ago looking at where we could be by the end of this decade from an EV production standpoint and looking at all the numbers or the numbers that the OEMs have publicly stated, some of their targets and taking some best guesses. I came up with a number of about 30 million light duty vehicles that we could, we could see the market producing a year by 2030. I stumbled about a week or so after that. I 30, put my 30 own million, 30 million, 30 million glo- as a global, global. yeah, global, right, yes, global. not just in the US. Right. Um, because the average global, you know, uh, LDV is somewhere 70 million ish. It goes up and down, but that's probably not a bad number to start with. Um, no, and especially, I, mm-hmm. especially with China pretty much mandating them and most of yeah. Europe uh, mm-hmm. mandating them. So, exactly. you know, I think everybody's waiting to see whether California goes through with their 2035 mandate for uh, no more ICE engines and light duty vehicles. I think they're, I, I guess I think they'll probably do it. I think they're holding off until after the current round of elections, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm not so, sure that will stand. I agree team. with that. Yeah. I, I think it, it could be like their early EV mandate and mm-hmm. they push everybody and then they have to back off. But yeah. I mean, clearly Europe and, and even more so than Europe, uh, China is uh, leading the surge and gonna, and gonna absorb most of that uh, 30 million production, I would imagine. Well, what do you think in North America, uh, the US and Canada combined? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, I, I calculated a global at 30, uh, 30 million, and you take 40% of that being China, you know, about 20-ish. Uh, uh, take some Europe away. Um, yeah, I mean, I could certainly, I, I'm trying to think of what our numbers are. Like I said, Canada, a good year is 2 million. 
What's a good year and in the U.S.? Fifteen. Well, right now, sixteen to seventeen. 16 that, to 17. You know, they always. That's where they they have that's to make money. Kind they of where do they. 15, they can't make money. Yes, yeah, so we're not even at twenty million. So I would say you know probably uh, eight to ten of that thirty is probably. I, I, by how long? By the by end 2030 of is potentially possible. You don't think you're so? saying half the market? Um, to really? be able to you're, be able you're much more optimistic than I. I am. You're absolutely right. I am a glass half uh, full kind of guy. So I'm saying I'm thinking from the production capabilities. Again, if the market is continues to grow and the demand continues to grow, the hurdles that you mentioned, John, are some but of the things that we continue. Years from now. That's yeah. only years from now. I'm, I know. <laughs> I, I just don't see them going from essentially 10% to 50% in that long. Now, you want to tell me a third of the market, mm -hmm. you know, so out of that 18 million, we see, I think it'd be a stretch even to see four or five, but Could be. anyway, uh, we'll see, I guess. I mean, Tesla itself, I mean, mind you, a lot of that's going to be overseas, you know, with China producing a lot of it, you know, I right. could see them doing 5 million units a year by 2030 as a standalone. Um, how much of that's North America, you know, we'd have to peel away maybe a couple of million. So yeah, you don't, you're right. Eight, 10 million is going to be too optimistic. Maybe five to six might be more in line with the reality of the North American side of things. Um, but and I think 30 the, is an achievable number globally. Um, probably, and, you know, probably. And, and I stumbled across a report afterwards that DNT did that said 29. So uh, not that I follow the analysts a lot, but just, you know, I got a little bit of verification that I can't be too far off the mark. And I'd rather see more, but, you know, at least uh, my point of that was that a lot of people think we're making this full transition in this short time. Some people are out there saying we're all driving EVs by 2030, but that's really not the reality of the situation. No, and it, and I've looked at the Wall Street analysts, mm -hmm. analyst projections, and they are all over the market. So a lot of this going to depend on the economy. But I do mm -hmm. think, like I said before, with things like the Silverado EV and yeah. the F one hundred and fifty Lightning, and uh, you know, thing affordable vehicles like you know, from VW and Chevrolet and all that, it's certainly going to spur it along. Um, Absolutely. You know, we're seeing brands Absolutely. like GM now that 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 no longer have any U.S. Uh, tax incentives, mm -hmm. you know, coming out with MSRPs that essentially reflect the price that you would have paid if you had incentives. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. they've, they've reduced the price so that they can be competitive to right. competitors that still offer the incentive. Uh, right. But we'll see, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I was hoping the pricing would be even better, but with inflation and what you know the the current uh, economic circumstances over the last couple of years that nobody could have foreseen, um, obviously because I think we've hit that sweet spot of a cost U.S. per kilowatt hour, uh, but it's a, it's not being reflected in cost parity yet because of these other factors, right? That continue to to push uh, OEM costs up. I was bothered by Nissan's announcement uh, just recently that they were, you know, going to phase out the Leaf and they would mm -hmm. be replaced with something that would be uh, more tunable to buyers' demands. I assume that means some sort of crossover. But my point <laughs> is, why would you phase out next to Tesla, the next best name, known mm -hmm. name, established name in electric vehicles? I and agree. so sometimes I scratch my head and say. <laughs> Do you not even have somebody in marketing that was around when the first leaf <laughs> was built? I mean, I wouldn't yeah. call it a leaf, uh, a leaf, it leaf cross or leaf plus cross. Sure. Something, you know, slap an, an all wheel drive system on it, raise the roof six inches and yeah. call it a leaf. And but don't dump the name. I but, totally, totally agree with you. In fact, it's funny you say that because I had a conversation uh, with somebody from Nissan on the weekend and exactly about that. And said something very similar that uh, that would be a bad move if they got rid of that. We still need those entry level cars. I mean, the Nissan Leaf Absolutely. 40 kilowatts, the cheapest EV you could get in Canada, you can walk out the door for well under forty thousand dollars Canadian tax in with incentives and stuff for a pretty capable urban community yep. vehicle that's going to cost you very minimal to operate per year. We forget about the Leaf when people ask you, <laughs> "What would you buy if you were buying your first electric car?" Mm -hmm. Leaf is an obvious answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's a car, but it's a hatchback. I mean, yeah. unless you, of course, you know, I know all wheel drive is as popular in your country as it is in the northern half of ours. But if you live in the southern part of our country where you can't give away an all wheel drive vehicle, <laughs> yeah, uh, 
you know, the leaf is, is perfect. And also the other soap boxes, remember folks, a front wheel drive vehicle with good snow, good all winter wood, winter tires. I have to correct myself. Yeah. Good winter tires is uh, Subaru did this study years ago. They said it's 90% as capable as an all wheel drive vehicle with touring tires. So I to totally agree with you. And I, I've been saying that. You have much I'm, more experience than I do. I do. And, you know, I've been driving since 16 and this Tesla Model 3 that I have now that I've had for two years of 2020, it's a dual motor. So it's an all wheel drive. It's the first all wheel drive car I've ever owned. And I've gone through, you know, 45 years of Canadian winters, good set of snow tires and proper, just, you know, understanding how your car will deal with certain situations and being smart within those certain you know those situations uh following what's going on is the main thing any closing comments uh, final thoughts john that you want to talk to folks about uh, you know hopefully this episode is coming is, is really a shot of realism of what's going on in the market where we're at where we think th things are going and that people do need to think these purchases and these these desires through in, in some cases more than maybe they would have on a regular ice car. Again, you know, me now having some experience in all electrics, I wouldn't think twice about another all electric. That's my experience. But again, as you mentioned, others, they, they may turn away from all electrics for whatever the experience. What are some of your final thoughts for some of the listeners here? I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, people to get into the EV market. We mentioned the LEAP, still very affordable, mm -hmm. Volkswagen, very affordable, some Chevrolet products, affordable. So yes. don't get too overcome by some of these price tags you see on Motor Week and magazines, <laughs> 60, 70, $80,000. There are going to be vehicles that are in line with what you uh, would normally pay for any vehicle in the market. In other words, in the U.S. dollars in the 30s and low 40s. Or even if they're slightly uh, more, your that, lower operating costs can chew that away. Quite yeah, well, that right? doesn't work mm -hmm. in this country. That, it doesn't that, work. No. That, I, that idea that oh, oh you're no. going to save all this money down the load. We are a Walmart nation. Oh no, country. we Please. want it. We want no, it John. cheap up front. But you're absolutely right, <laughs> yeah. of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Although they still do require some maintenance, and uh, unlike sure. some of the manufacturers trying to sub. But so there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. I think that it that it when you get ready. Here's my next pitch. When you get ready in the next 24 months to either buy a used car as a second car or buy something for, say, you've got a teenager in the family who's got their driver's license and you would normally often buy them a very reliable used car, start looking at the used car market because an awful lot of these early EVs and I'm not particularly talking about Tesla who controls mm -hmm. their market, but for other brands, they're being leased on two-year leases. Right. So by 2024, there's going to be an awful lot of off-lease electric vehicles that will have batteries that will probably still have 200, 250 miles worth of range on them. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a fabulous vehicle to get a hold of either for a sibling because it'll have all the latest safety stuff on it mm -hmm. or for yourself. Uh, give the sibling your old ice engine car and you replace it with that. So I think the used vehicle market is going to be very, very interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. Now, if history repeats itself and used battery vehicles retain their, their, their value even more so, I don't think that's going to be as what, as it was, because I think more people that have just gotten accustomed, there'll be more demand. But right. the used vehicle market right. could actually spur the adoption of electric vehicles into far more households than all the government mm -hmm. uh, persuasions and money thrown at you uh, can. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. I think that uh, electric vehicles are here to stay. I think it is the wave of the future. Yeah, someday we might all switch over to uh, fuel cell vehicles. But remember, fuel cell vehicles are electric vehicles too. Mm -hmm. It just gets the electric from a fuel cell instead of a lithium ion or some other componentry battery. So I, I don't want to be, I don't want to come across as negative. I am a realist. I think this is going to take time. I think you have a right to be wary. Make sure the vehicle fits your lifestyle, as you well mentioned. But you can get into them with vehicles like the Leaf or from VW or even Chevrolet or lots of probably other brands easily. 
the Ford F-150 Lightning, a fabulous pickup truck. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to basically be go going towing a huge trailer or using it for super long distance, it's a no brainer. I'm sure mm -hmm. the Silverado will be the same. Yeah. Uh, and the Dodge Ram think, eventually when we see it. So Dodge Ram, yeah, they're yeah, not here. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, just like <laughs> stop talking about Tesla's Cybertruck. It yeah. ain't here. You know, you can talk yeah. about it all day long, but you can go buy an F-150 Lightning today. That's true. And it's a marvelous piece of work. And you can power your house with it if you if you're uh, if you have a power outage, like we're having been having in the east with all our storms in the last month. Yeah, well, we've had that wow. here. That's a great point. You know, they bring a different anyway. dynamic, the whole work workplace environment, right? You, where you can weld from the front of your truck and stuff because you have the power. It's uh, it's an interesting dynamic. I certainly agree with you, John. Um, and, and I follow that that mantra probably, you know, sub, un, subconsciously, I didn't even realize, but I'm I'm a realist as well and try to you know, try to just help educate and create that awareness and answer the questions. And I'm, I'm the first guy to say, you know, maybe an EV is not for you because of these circumstances. So I only one more little thing that's just popped sure. up. I love the fact that the F-150 can be used to power workplace and, mm -hmm. and also obviously our home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you got to have the right distribution panel and all that, mm -hmm. but you can make it work. Um, I have a distribution panel in my house. I have a portable generator. We mm -hmm. lost power for about six hours. First time I've had to crank it up in a long time. It ran, it powered a lot of the stuff in my house. I don't think any manufacturer in their right mind should be building an all electric battery electric vehicle without building in the capability to at least power some form of electricity emergency power for your home. Right, right. I know you can get adapters. Mm -hmm. They work on some vehicles and some they don't, mm -hmm. but that should be built into every vehicle. And what an amazing selling point that you're missing to yeah. go to the, I mean, the Kohler generator people are going to hate you, but, <laughs> but to go be able to, to say, and by the way, you spent all this money, but you can save about 10 grand, not have to put an extra generator next to your house. And with this little device you plug in here, you can get enough power to your house to run the refrigerator and the freezer. We all seem to be just consumed with that. That's right. Uh, and maybe your well pump if you're on a well. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. Yeah, I know that right. during that power outage, and I was driving, I think it was an EV6 that night, uh, and I didn't have the adapter. Didn't have the adapter, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I said, there, all that power is sitting here. <laughs> I can't use it when I really yeah. need it. And, you know, that's you mentioned the leaf earlier. It, it again kind of went under the radar as being something that's supported bidirectional since its inception, basically, which in Japan is used quite heavily in some of those other continents and countries. But you know, now it's all of a sudden becoming they never talk part of the settling. It. They never talk about it. Yeah. But uh, in other markets, they do. Excellent stuff. I really appreciate your time, John. I know that we've gone to, to the top of the hour that we're recording this. Um, you know, I'm glad that we were able to meet again, for those who don't know, John Davis, creator, host, managing director of Motor Week. Uh, again, in the 41 years in uh, doing what you guys do, broadcasting, I watch it all the time. Lots, as you said, many, many different screens and formats that you can catch Motor Week on. To me, you are, you guys are the authoritative source. And I mean, you know, I don't really watch the other guys. Yep. Be smart with your purchases. Don't yeah. uh, don't uh, knee jerk uh, purchase of any type of vehicle. Right. Right. Uh, uh, but take a hard right. look at uh, the newest uh, BEVs and plug in hybrids. Yeah. Uh, if you look hard enough, I yeah. think you'll find something that might appeal to you. And you know, I know everybody that owns them loves them. And uh, well, mm -hmm. I don't wouldn't say everybody, but I know most <laughs> of my friends that own them do love them. I have one friend who's owned, I think, six uh, distinct uh, BEVs so far. Wow. Started with the original Leaf, and uh, he's very happy he'll never go back. And I can't uh, wait to find I out. Think that's, that's a minority of people, yeah. but I yeah. think it's going to grow. And I think the world will be a better uh, place uh, for it. And I can't wait to find out eventually what all electric vehicle you finally do purchase at some point in time. Uh, I think and it's going to be the next thing. I yeah. want to tell you, I think it's yeah. the new Mini. Yeah. The there new Mini go. with the new, uh, new architecture and substantial. Nice. Still looking to, to basically uh, get it into a Mini EV. And I, but that I asked, would be a town, that would be for a town car. Nice. Well, again, a big thanks, John, for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to meet with me. 
Um, and uh, if I ever get a chance to come down uh, to your neck of the woods, you know, uh, I'd love to meet up and buy you lunch at some point in time if our if our paths scheduled, um, because I do oh, try to get out you. and about. So come down to Owings Mills. Great. Well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. And you take care of yourself and all the best. Thanks, Ken. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.